Tonight, why anti-oil protesters will never stop driving their cars. It's December 30th. You're watching The Ezra Levant Show. Why should others go to jail Why? when you're a biggest carbon yeah. consumer I know? There's 8,500 customers here, and you won't give them an answer. You come here once a year with a sign, and you feel morally superior. The only thing I have to say to the government for why I publish it is because it's my bloody right to do so. Like most people, I don't have a lot of time for vegetarians. With a few exceptions, it seems to be all about moral posing, virtue signaling, as if not eating meat is a sign of righteousness. I'm no psychologist, but I'd guess it's just a crutch for people who feel helpless in face of the world's real problems, who don't know how to deal with real moral crises, so they putter on the one thing they can control, what they eat. So it's a way of coping with their true feelings of impotence and irrelevance as the world goes to hell. So in a morally chaotic world that needs real help and heroism, being a vegetarianism is like an easy way out of actually fixing the world's real problems and just not eating meat. And anyhow, it's just my theory. But I'll say this for vegetarians. I'll give them this. They may be anemic. They may, may be tired all the time and extremely boring to talk to. They may lie about how delicious their quinoa burger is or their soy milk latte, but I will give them this. They do not preach vegetarianism at you while they're chomping on a chicken drumstick or eating a big juicy steak. I'll give them that. You don't find someone who owns a butcher shop preaching vegetarianism. I mean, duh. But can you name me a single anti-oil activist? a single anti-fossil fuel activist, a single global warming activist who does not fly or drive or heat their home in the winter or, you, or use even the less obvious fruits of oil and gas like plastics and synthetic fibers. I'm not just talking about the super hypocrites like Al Gore or Jane Fonda or Daryl Hannah or Leonardo DiCaprio who fly to environmental protests in a private jet, a private jet. I'm not just talking about the David Suzuki's with his four homes, including his main home in Vancouver, the one on a double lot. He also owns part of an island co-owned with an oil company, an oil company, David Suzuki's business partner. That's just awesome, isn't it? I'm talking about the ordinary people who follow these eco-shepherds like clueless sheep. They don't even stop to think about how nuts it is to drive a car to a rally against cars to tweet or Facebook about how much they hate oil using computer technology, using an iPhone that would be impossible to make without oil or petrochemicals like plastic. Show me a computer that's made out of twigs or berries, please. So why? I mean, how? How could you handle the cognitive dissonance between using oil and gas and petrochemicals and the things that come from mining, let's say, while condemning all of those things? It's one of my favorite questions to ask protesters. Do you have a car? Yes, of course I have a car. Do you have a car yourself? Yes, I do. Do you have a car? I do have a car. We all use cars. Don't you use a car? Yes, I do. Do you have a car? Do these people not know that what they are demanding, getting off fossil fuels, getting off oil, getting off anything from that's mined, bringing in carbon taxes, regulations, that sort of thing, do they not realize that will punish their current behavior? Can they not see that they have not chosen voluntarily to live by their own professed creed, but that their demands, if ever enacted, would compel them to do things they have obviously chosen not to do? It is as absurd as a vegetarian protester eating KFC. But it's not real. Like I say, it's about virtue signaling. Greenpeace's famous ships run on bunker fuel, the heaviest oil there is. One of their senior executives, Pascal Husting, was caught commuting to work each week by jet. Commuting by jet, 250 miles each way. He didn't stop because Greenpeace told him to stop. He stopped because word leaked out and he was embarrassed. Now he goes by train that runs on fuel, of course. They're all liars. Even the Unabomber, Ted Kaczynski, the serial murderer and environmental extremist who claimed to hate all of industrial civilization, 
So he went to live in the woods, remember him? Of course, the bombs he used to murder people were the products of the industrial age. But even his crummy cabin in the woods, off the grid, even there, his perfect little anti-fossil fuel utopia, that murderous little hypocrite, still used plastic. Take a look. Plastic containers, plastic vials for water, plastic vats. He could have done what people did pre-industrial age, used animal bladders, made wooden barrels. But even he, an anti-industrialist murderer, killing in the name of environmental Luddism, even he would not live up to his false creed. They're liars. Some of the best thinking I've come across on this issue is that by Alex Epstein the author of the book, The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels. He points out a lot of outstanding facts and more importantly, ways of thinking about oil and gas, but one of them is the most obvious. It's that Mother Nature, Mother Earth, is not a gentle, caring mother. Nature, red in tooth and claw, is deadly. Not just wild animals, of course, but the environment itself. Epstein points out an obvious example, a thunderstorm with lightning. We think it's exciting, maybe even romantic, but before the era of industrialization and protection from the elements, it would mean death. Until the industrial age, deserts meant discomfort and death. Now you can drive in your air-conditioned SUV with nice big cup holders through it. Until the industrial age, cold days in the winter meant death. Snowstorms meant death. I mean, to this day, more people die from cold than by heat. But in our industrial age, we have a snug, heated home with lots of electric light and warmth. This is the disnification of the wilds. Oil and gas and industry have tamed the wild and made the world safe and inhabitable. So we forget about how hard life is without oil and gas. One of my favorite pop philosophers, Bill Whittle, came up with a thought experiment. I mean, he would never enforce it. It was just a hypothetical sociological thought experiment. He said, his cure for not just leftist protesters, but for the entire whiny, entitled, left-wing, self-esteem-based culture of social justice warriors is to send everyone into the woods for three and a half days. Here, listen to him explain his experiment. During those three and a half days, I would force everyone to live out in the woods in a cabin. I wouldn't make anyone chop wood. If you want to shiver through three nights, that's your business. I'd make people carry their own water up from the river. Hey. If you don't want to go to the trouble to boil it, be my guest. Recovering from amoebic dysentery will be part of your education. I'd make everybody grow and harvest their own food or dig up roots or collect berries or not. You can sit and complain about it and not eat for three and a half days if you'd prefer. And like most modern Americans, I have a soft spot for little furry animals. But I would make people trap and kill and skin them in order to stay alive. That goes for chickens and fish as well. You see, reality can be ugly and bloody and horrible. And that's something that those protesters have been protected from their entire lives, but not anymore. Playtime is over now. I love that guy. We got to get him on this show to for the interview. He's so smart. But what a great point he makes. I mean, try telling a millennial leftist protester to go without his iPhone for three and a half hours, let alone three and a half days. Try going without a latte for three and a half days. Try anything that requires a reintroduction with the miracle of industrialization by doing without industry for three and a half days. And yeah, try getting reacquainted with the real mother nature for three and a half days. Bill's a liberal, so he would never force such deprivations on our society. But you have to agree, it would be just about the only wake up call most anti-oil protest drones would ever pay attention to. Uh, stick ahead, we've got some great conversations, including with my favorite Alberta Bureau Chief, Sheila Gunnery. Don't go away more after these words. recommended by our climate change panel, 
Alberta will be phasing in a $30 per tonne economy-wide carbon price. We will implement an accelerated phase-out of coal, clean research and technology, green infrastructure like public transit, to help finance the transition to renewable energy and efficiency programs to help people reduce their energy use. That's Rachel Notley announcing the new carbon tax in Alberta, a carbon tax that was not outlined in her campaign platform when she won in May of this year. A carbon tax that is so widespread it touches everything possible that it's really a provincial sales tax, ending Alberta's uh, reputation as a tax, low tax haven, the only provincial jurisdiction without a provincial sales tax. Joining me now to talk about this is our friend Sheila Gunn-Reed, the Alberta Bureau Chief of the Rebel. Sheila, great to see you. Thanks for joining us via Skype from Fort Saskatchewan. Thanks for having me. Well, you have been leading the charge in our coverage about the Alberta NDP's war on farms, and that has been very urgent because Bill 6, the Farm Unionization Act, was rammed through in a matter of weeks, no consultation, forced down farmers' throats over what I've seen is uni unanimous opposition. I haven't seen a single farmer, not one, who says they want it. That was urgent, but the announcement that Rachel Notley made about the carbon tax, that's a slow burn, long-term war on oil that actually won't even get into full gear. 2017 2018 she's out to kill that industry in a way that she doesn't even have uh, a hatred for farmers in the same way what do you think uh, well i think it's a slow choke but a slow chokehold she's putting on the industry um, and it's not just the oil patch it's going to be on our home heating costs um, it's going to be on i mean part of this is the coal phase out so while um while she's raising money with the carbon tax, she's really robbing it from the pockets of everyday Albertans. You know what, you're right, and I'm glad you point that out, because actually, some of the larger oil sands companies themselves, including, by the way, four oil sands companies endorsed the carbon tax. I thought, well, since when do chickens endorse Colonel Sanders? Well, if you look at the fine print in the carbon tax, it will raise $6 billion a year, and give three billion back well to whom well to rachel notley's favored groups including certain big emitters like wouldn't you know it shell synovus uh cnrl some of the companies that stood with her when she announced it so it's actually not as much a, a tax a carbon tax on those big oil sands companies as it is on the little guy and as you point out a total extermination of the coal industry and any towns that happen to be in those sacrifice zones too. Well, and that's really the thing. We've seen what's going to happen in Hannah, Alberta with their, with the phase out of their coal mine there, we're going to see one in 10 people unemployed just by that one act alone. That doesn't take into account the shallow natural gas that's in the area that's going to probably be sitting idle due to the um, royalty review and the carbon tax. Well, that's another point is we're not even done yet. The royalty review hasn't even come in. That's going to be, who knows what that's, in, and until it comes in, if you had a billion dollars to invest in oil and gas around the world, and oil and gas is produced in dozens of countries around the world, until that oil uh, royalty review comes down, you would be foolish to invest in Alberta. You would rather go to North Dakota or Texas or even Russia or even Iraq than to put it in Alberta, because you just don't know. You can't do the calculations other than one calculation. You know that the premier of the province despises oil, so does his entire staff. Well, and that's the thing. We've seen large companies who, are, who might not be the benefactors of Rachel Notley's carbon tax wealth transfer, like Encana, pull investment out of the eastern slopes of the Alberta Rockies and take it and plunk it right into Texas. So when people are saying, well, you know, it's the it's the price of oil that's driving the economy down and hurting Alberta, well, that's not true. The price of oil is the same all over, and people are investing in Texas and withdrawing their capital investment from Alberta. You know, I, I got one last question for you. I mean, uh, you and I look at the statistics of the Alberta economy a lot. I know you've done work on, for example, the unemployment insurance rate, the employment insurance rate, which has gone up 100% over the last year. Uh, the 
unemployment rate itself, which is now at the national average, first time that's happened in 30 years, a lot of these statistics, I think that the NDP, or at least the saner ones in their caucus, realize they are a one-term government, an accidental government that were elected in a perfect storm when Jim Prentice tacked hard to the left and Danielle Smith dissolved her, tried to dissolve the Wild Rose Party. It was in that perfect storm that people said, oh, who's left? Well, Rachel Notley looks friendly, vote for her. I remember the Abacus data survey the week after the Alberta election that said 93% of NDP voters said this wasn't about NDP policy, it was just about change. So I, my point is, I think that the NDPers know that they have one term. My theory, Sheila, I'd like you to feedback on this, is that they say, we are ideological radicals. We are true socialists, true activists. If you look at the caucus, it's not sort of regular folks. It's all professional activists, union organizers, the type of people who put their names down thinking they would just be, you know, hope, uh, hopeless candidates and won accidentally. So they say, look, we've got three and a half years left let us be as ideologically radical as possible, as devastating as possible, so that when we lose in four years, we have planted such seeds of socialism and big government and union activism that it will take a decade for whatever government follows, follows us to pull out the roots of what we do if they ever can. That's my theory. What do you say? Do you know what? It, I. I... I would tend to agree. I think that a, um, a one-term socialist government who knows they're a one-term socialist government is far more dangerous than a slow-moving socialist government that wants to stay in power for a long time. These guys know the writing is on the wall for them, and they're going to get as much of their agenda pushed through as they can, and we are going to be paying for it for a long, long time. I think you're right. I mean, the NDP governments of British Columbia and Saskatchewan, they had, they had a hope that they would endure. Saskatchewan especially, they knew that while well, their friends and neighbors are going to have to be there, they have to be reasonable enough. That's not the case in Alberta. And when you have so many Vancouver and Toronto staff coming in to run the government like colonial settlers, when their real homes and hearts are back in Vancouver and Toronto, they don't have a stake in the future in Alberta. I mean, at least if you had real Albertans who were in the socialist government, they would, they would have a natural check saying, yikes, you're really going to do that to my hometown, to my friends and neighbors? But these folks who are running the government, 10 out of 12 chiefs of staff of, of this NDP government are not from the province. It is like an occupational guy. I mean, I, I don't mean to be overly dramatic, but these are hired mercenaries from other places that do not care about Alberta's future, other than when they go back to Toronto and Vancouver in a few years to run the NDP campaigns there, they can tell big war stories of how they finally tamed Alberta that the whole NDP has always hated. Last 30 seconds to you, Sheila. Well, moreover to your point, a lot of the NDP MLAs don't even live in their riding, so they don't feel responsible to the people they're harming with their bad decisions either. So, I mean, it, it's the common theme of this government. They're disconnected. They're not one of us. Yeah, isn't that incredible? Sheila Gunn-Reed, our Alberta Bureau Chief, just a real star in our coverage in that province. Thank goodness you've been doing the work you have, and good luck to all of us in 2016. Thanks, Sheila. Stick around, folks. More after these words. Looking for the perfect gift? Did you know the Rebel.media has a store? Make a statement with a t-shirt. Have your morning coffee in a Fearless Travel coffee mug. There's even an Ezra LeVant bobblehead. It's a one-stop shop for the perfect gift. And don't forget to pick up something for yourself. Go to the Rebel.media slash store to find out more. Welcome back. Well, we like talking about oil and gas on this show. I wrote a book called Ethical Oil. I've been interested for a long time. It's not just because I'm from Alberta. It's because it's such an important industry and an economic benefit to the entire country. And so when oil prices tanked last year, that started causing problems that were compounded by policy choices made by Alberta's new Democrat premier, Rachel Notley, joining us now from Edmonton via Skype to talk about that and what it means for Alberta's future and indeed Canada's is our friend Lauren Gunter, senior columnist for the Edmonton Sun. Lauren, great to see you again. 
Thanks, Ezra. I mean, look, the oil the price of oil goes up, price of oil goes down. Albertans are used to the boom and bust cycle, massive layoffs. Albertans have sort of trained themselves not to whine to the government for a bailout like the auto industry in Ontario or like Bombardier or the aircraft industry in Quebec. Albertans are stoic that way. But what's happening to them, I think, is that while they're down, they're being kicked by their yeah. own premier. And that makes it especially tough to complain because it's not shake your fist at Ottawa now. It's your own government that's doing it to you. Can you summarize the injuries that have been added to insult in Alberta when it comes to oil and gas policy? It's a very, very long list. You have, uh, of course, a uh, new climate change and environmental regulations. You have a royalty review that's going on, which is going to hold up all the investment in, in oil and gas. Uh, if, if world oil prices weren't enough, the, the royalty review will be uh, a, a pause. We'll put a pause on every investor until they know what the tax regime is going to be. Uh, you've got uh, income tax increases. You've got a new carbon tax, which is basically a provincial sales tax. It's always been assumed that any government that brought in a PST in Alberta would be voted out at the earliest possible uh, chance. Uh, so the, the NDP are going to put a tax on just about everything, but they're going to call it a carbon tax. Now, the fact that it's going to take the same amount of money out of the uh, economy as a 3% PST, uh, that, that doesn't matter to them. So you've got that. Then you have all all sorts of other things. You have a minimum wage hike of 48% from $10.50, not quite 10 50 to uh, $15 an hour. You've got uh, all sorts of new regulations on farming. Uh, the list goes on and on and on. Uh, income taxes are now much higher in Alberta than they used to be. Gone is the Alberta advantage. People who are you know, close followers of Alberta politics will know that Ralph Klein used to love to talk about the Alberta advantage, which meant that it was easier to do business here and you would get to keep more of the money that you made. That's all gone. And I think that the cumulative effect of all of that, you talked about compounding, I think the cumulative effect of all of that is that Alberta is going to be a year or two longer recovering from the current economic that otherwise would have been. I think you're right. The other day, that for the first time in more than 30 years, Alberta's unemployment rate is the same or higher than the national unemployment rate. All those advantages that you talked about, low taxes, ease of doing business, are gone. But even more importantly, the goose that lays the golden egg is being particularly attacked. And let me give you an example. Uh, when Shell announced that it was abandoning a $2 billion project, when other companies are announcing massive delays of multi-billion dollar projects, those don't come back in one or two years. Maybe they'll come back one day, but th those aren't delays. I mean, and, and here's something that I keep on pointing out, because uh, apologists for the NDP say, oh, it's the low price of oil. You're not blaming Rachel Notley for that, are you? Well, when Husky and Shell pulled out of Alberta, started selling Alberta assets or canceling their projects, they announced where they were putting their investments instead. And Canna, said it's going to reduce spending in Alberta and increase spending in Texas. This, you know, Texas is suffering from a no low oil price too, but then Canada can't wait to invest more there. So it's not just the low price of oil. It is the special anti-oil malice. Here's a question for you, Lauren. Do, do people believe Rachel Notley and the Alberta NDP when they say with a straight face, we like the oil sands. We want it to be a healthy industry. Do people believe it when they, when they look them dead in the eye and say, oh, we, we like the oil and gas industry? Well, unfortunately, most, for most people, the only face they have on this NDP government is Rachel Motley. And she is an appealing, you know, a, a charming person, uh, at least in public. I think in private, she's a very acerbic person. But the, uh, but, so a lot of them take her at face value because they don't know anything different yet. But if you look at their caucus, the caucus is full of people who, A, never expected to get elected into the legislature, and B, therefore have lots of very radical ideas, particularly anti-oil ideas. They're fundamental environmentalists. They are anti-pipeline, anti-oil sense. They, there are a lot of people in that NDP caucus, as you know, because you did some of the very early research on this on this gang, uh, you've got people in that caucus who who had posted on social media, lots of them, that the oil sands is the
the dirtiest developmental program in the world. I mean, it's not even close, but it's one of those things that environmentalists in North America have told themselves, hand-wringingly told themselves over and over again. And that's what the NDP caucus is like. Yeah. You know, it's incredible to me. Uh, I think Rachel Notley herself was surprised when she was elected. Of course she was. Uh, like the whole world, until about a month before the election, she thought, oh, I'm going to get a handful of office. Like, her whole life, she was a sort of a professional outsider with a toe on the inside. She was a professional protester paid for by taxpayers. She would attend all the rallies outside the legislature, but she would get to ask questions inside too. It was sort of like a family business. That's what her father, Grant Notley, did as the leader of the NDP. And then one day, a terrible thing happened. It would be like, you know, when they, you know, when you, they say, what happens if that dog ever, ever catches up to a car? What will it do with it? What happens if the NDP campaigns for government and actually gets it and has to govern Alberta? And I think she said, oh my God, I was anti-everything and now I've got to run the thing I didn't like. And so she reached outside the province for mercenaries. That's another thing that I think has been very underreported. Well, 10 out of 12 chiefs of staff. Imagine if the had done that. Imagine if the government that, that they just replaced had gone to, to the United States to pick up all of its executive assistants and its communication specialists, the way Notley's gone to Ontario and BC to find NDP hacks with enough experience to come to Alberta. The other thing too that is that is remarkable to me is you know you, you you remember back when Stephen Harper was the Prime Minister there were all these media stories all the time about what a control freak he was, what a dictator he was, how everything in, in his caucus had to go through his office to be approved. Ministers and MPs couldn't speak out. That they he had nothing on Rachel Motley. She understands that she is sitting on top of the least experienced uh, caucus ever elected as a government in Alberta, and probably one of the least uh, uh, experienced ones ever elected anywhere in the country. I remember when, when the Liberals in, in New Brunswick won all the seats one time, maybe there were as many inexperienced MLAs in that group as this one. But you have people whose number one job category on their resumes before they were elected was social work, and number two was student. So you had a lot of people who never had any experience, even in at the school board level. Um, and, and so they're terribly inexperienced, and to prevent them from having all sorts of bozo eruptions in the NDP caucus, Notley keeps the tightest clamps I have ever seen on a caucus. And uh, and that's the reason why, is it's, they're just deathly afraid of the next eruption that's going to happen. Yeah. Earlier this month, uh, speaking of eruptions, it was an interesting point you make about how in public she's always smiling, but it, it looks sort of like a rictus grin. It's like a grin. But in public, you see those flashes of acid. I, I saw those in some of the old file footage of her protests, but we saw that uh, earlier this month at her Christmas party. I think it was at Grant McEwen College in Edmonton where she, when her guard was down, when she was with NDP students and friends, you know, uh, laughed at the farmer, said, Bill Six, <laughs> my favorite Bill. And there was a full minute of laughing and cheering. There's an edge here I don't think Albertans or Canadians have seen yet. It's a militant union, professional political edge. And I think when Albertans realize what they've done to themselves by electing these accidental MLAs, that the sense of betrayal and rage will be very deep. Last word to you, Lauren. Yeah, well, I'll leave you with one short story. She spoke uh, just after the uh, federal election to the Alberta Chambers of Commerce, and she asked at the end for comments about what the government was doing. And one person got up and said, well, you know what, it's not each individual thing you're doing. It's not the tax increases, the spending, the regulations. It's all of this together, and that is going to uh, defeat our economy. And the day after, that person was phoned by the premier's assistant and told to apologize because oh she was God. supposed to have the last word. She is the premier. And while she invited comments, she didn't mean that. And he should have known that. Oh, That's my the kind of person God. She That's incredible. W was this reported? No, it hasn't been yet. You're getting this for the first time. It's it's in my year-end uh, piece that, that, that's appearing that shortly. That is incredible. That I mean, imagine. Imagine if Stephen Harper or Ralph Klein had called someone and said, how dare you, question. Just incredible. Well, it's amazing to me all this has happened. Sorry, go ahead. She's becoming known as Rachel Redford. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Well, but of course, Alison Redford did not have the same hammerlock on her, whole, her own caucus as was evident. That's the thing. Alison Redford 
like uh, Premier Ed Stelmack before her, were expelled by the PC caucus because they felt they had an existence uh, outside and beyond that transcended those leaders. I think every one of these accidental MLAs, many of whom, like you say, are students or barely out of school, they know that they have no clue, so they have no limit that cannot be crossed. Alison Redford, Ed Stelmack, uh, uh, upset the Tory caucus and were thrown out. I don't think Rachel Notley would ever be thrown out by her own caucus because they're even worse and more amateur and more lost than she is. Hey, good point, good point. Lauren Gutter, great to see you. A depressing way to end the year, but yeah, 2016 I think is going to be even worse. And the carbon tax kicks in in barely 12 months. That's going to be a lot of pain for an economy that doesn't need any more pain right now. Good to see you, my friend. Keep fighting for freedom. Have a good new year. Okay, you two folks stick around. More after the break. Ontario residents are being hosed on electricity prices. The latest Auditor General's report says we've been overcharged by $37 billion over the last several years. That works out to nearly $2,800 for every man, woman and child. Why? Mismanagement and bad policy choices from the Ontario Liberals. It's going to cost us billions more in coming years. Energy Minister Bob Shirelli won't take responsibility. He's lashing out. It's time for Bob to go. If you agree, go to firebob.ca. That's firebob.ca and make your voice heard. Welcome back. I enjoy the show today because I like talking to Lauren and Sheila, smart people. You know, we are so luxurious. Uh, you know, there's these memes online, white people problems. You know, we're so luxurious that we have to invent problems, problems that in the third world, the developing world, they would not call us problems, having too much energy. So we have Earth Hour where we fake being poor for an hour. Yeah, it's Earth Hour all the time in North Korea, you know, where we fake going without, without luxuries. Yeah, it's that way in much of Asia and most of Africa all the time. Only us in the decadent, luxurious West who haven't faced hardship in two, three generations, only us would engage in the fantasy of the whole global warming debate. That's why in China and India, where they're trying to lift people up out of desperate poverty, they listen to rich Western countries debate how many angels dance on the head of a pin, how many puffs of carbon dioxide is too much or too little, and they say, well, what are you talking about carbon dioxide? It's a, it's a naturally occurring gas. It's people breathe it out, plants breathe it in. You are crazy. And when they hear that the Western nations want to tax themselves and spend money on wind turbines, they say, you are crazy. Well, that's what Bill Whittle was talking about, is what happens when a whole generation of Americans and Canadians grow up and think oil is bad, but haven't been taught critical thinking enough to realize we use oil every day. And the fruits of industry are not, you know, they don't accrue only to capitalists and top hats. But to all of us who love air-conditioned cars in the summertime, heated homes in the winter, and like tweeting and Facebooking on our iPhones. Oh, brother. I'm Ezra Levant. You keep fighting for freedom. Send me your notes, too. Let me know what you think. Ezra at the Facebook us, or tweet us. That's all for today's show, everybody. Good night.